Welcome to Staying Connected, a podcast where I talk to other people about their stories with VEDS or Vascular Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. Hey everyone, and welcome back to Staying Connected. This is your host, Katie, and before we get into the show, I want to remind you that the views, information, and opinions in these podcasts are those of the individuals involved and do not represent the opinions of the Marfan Foundation. The Marfan Foundation is not responsible for and does not verify for accuracy any of the information contained in them, nor does the information constitute medical or other professional advice or services. This show is not produced by or affiliated with the Marfan Foundation or the VEDS movement. In the last episode, we talked to Christy Gann, who was diagnosed with VEDS recently after her son Hunter passed away from an aortic dissection last year. In today's episode, we're going to talk to Samantha Archie, who was diagnosed with VEDS following a uterine rupture during the delivery of her second child. Samantha was concerned that she might have VEDS prior to this, but struggled to get genetic testing. Before we go over to the interview, if you want to support this show, consider joining my Patreon. For a few dollars a month, you can make sure this show continues to reach people around the world with real-life stories about VEDS. You can join the Patreon at patreon.com slash translucentone, and you can also support the show by sharing this podcast with people you know to help us raise awareness of VEDS around the world together. Thank you so much for your support, and a big thanks to my current patrons who have already been supporting the show. My top-tier patrons are listed in the episode show notes. Okay, let's go to the interview. Hey, Samantha, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast and for sharing your story with VEDS with everybody. You want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Uh, Sure. My name is Samantha. I live in Michigan, and I was diagnosed with VEDS in, let's see, September will be a year, so almost a year. Oh, so not that long ago. Right. Mm -hmm. So how were you diagnosed? How did this come about? So I kind of, so I had some symptoms of uh, Ehlers-Danlos ever since I was a child with like the joint hypermobility um, and the easy bruising, which as a child, you, you bump into things, you're rowdy, you get bruises easily. So you don't really pay attention to like the amount of bruises and that it's not normal to have so many like on your shins and on your arms and just, and not knowing where they came from. Um, and I knew I was different then because my legs are very hypermobile. They bend back at the knees a lot. And I used to get picked on in school a lot for that. And then when I showed them how my thumbs are hypermobile, they, then they thought it was cool. So Mm -hmm. I had that saving me, but, um, you know, I didn't really start showing symptoms until I want to say maybe 2014. So, or maybe 2013, I started getting like dizzy spells, um, like sensations of feeling like I was like almost going to pass out, but I wouldn't, I would, I'd still be standing there. It's almost like a rush feeling. And then my heart would be racing And at first I thought I had um, a caffeine, like a sensitivity, because at the time I was in school and I was drinking coffee and I was like, I think I'm allergic to caffeine. And my dad still makes fun of me for that. (laughs) Um, Not knowing that it was a VEDS related symptom. Yeah. When I want to say back in maybe 2014 is when I had my biggest um, symptom that kind of triggered me to say, okay, something's not right. I was at the zoo with my husband who at the time was my boyfriend and we were walking through the zoo and there was a curb. Um, and we were stepping on it to like, look into the bear Mm -hmm. habitat. And I stepped down and when I stepped, I didn't like jump or anything, but I, you know, I stepped down and I busted a vein in my leg, my lower leg, and my whole leg swelled up, it bruised, and I couldn't even walk, I had to hop out of the zoo. And at that moment, I knew um, this isn't right. Um, And I was in nursing school at the time. So I was very aware of, um, like, human anatomy and what things are normal and aren't normal. And so I was a little more honed in on the some like symptoms. And 
at the time I was a nurse assistant and I didn't have very good insurance. So I went to a new doctor. She wasn't my normal PCP growing up. It was the first time I saw her and I asked her about it. I said, um, you know, I, I do bruise easy, but this was the first time anything like that's happened. So it was kind of scary not knowing why this happened. And she did all the blood work to kind of, um, look like, look through all of the conditions like blood disorders, like clotting Mm -hmm. disorders and stuff like that. And my blood work came back normal. So she said, everything looks fine. Um, you're fine. You just need to put more lotion on your skin. And when she, yeah. And when she said that, I was like, this is, that's not right. Like, I know I'm not a nurse yet, but I mean, that's, that's, I was so shocked. I never went back to her. So I kind of moved on past that. Um, you know, and then I do have the GI issues where if I eat a lot of the times, I feel like my food just sits there. Like it's not moving through and I feel sick and I've had those issues for a while. I tried looking into, you know, what, what this could be and never could really find anything. And then I started watching, um, Okay. Well, I'm a fan of like drag race. Um, and I started watching RuPaul's drag race this season. And one of the Queens had Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. And this is the first time I heard about Ehlers-Danlos and she's talking about the giant hypermobility and how she can easily like dislocate her knees and, um, skin issues. And it kind of had a little light bulb go off. And I said, let me look into this. And at this time, so this is like 2018 because my son was just born. My first son was born in 2017 and he was a little over a year when the show came on. And I remember knowing that because when I started reading about VEDS, I got very emotional because when you first read about it, it's, it's pretty much like you're going to die at 48. You're going to die at 46 and just having a baby I was a mess. I was crying on the couch and my husband was like, you don't know if you have that. You don't cry. We'll look into it. And I was like, okay, I'll look into it. Because when I was reading through the Ehlers-Danlos, I know there was, is it 13 subtypes? Yeah, I think there's 14 now, but I'm not sure if the 14th has been published. Yeah. The, with all of the subtypes, you know, cause I did have the hypermobility. I do have like the, the skin, the scarring, the keloids and, and then when I read the, about the VEDS, it said like sleeping with your eyes open with the easy bruising and the thin skin and all of the stuff. And I was like, oh my gosh. So at that moment, I started going on my discovery. I needed to try to mm-hmm. find out if I have this. So it so was like it, four years ago in 2018. Yeah, I would say, yeah, 2018. That's when okay. I started. And it was stressful. I went to my PCP at first. She didn't know what Ehlers like VEDS was. And then she told me, well, you know, we can look into getting genetic testing done, but the healthcare system that I go through, um, once you're over the age of 26, she said, you have to go to U of M genetic. Like once you're over that age, they don't do it at Beaumont anymore. So I was like, okay, well, can we try to get testing done at U of M? She wrote me a script to U of M and I contacted them and I talked with them and they were so rude on the phone. They were pretty much like, we won't test you for Ehlers-Danlos. And I was like shocked, you know, working in healthcare at the time. At this time I am a nurse, you know, and right. I, I know like you don't talk to people like that. And she, I, she was so rude. And I couldn't believe it. So I was like, okay, I'm trying to talk with her. Like, what else do I need? Thinking like, oh, she needs more clinical information for them to do the testing. So now I've gone back to my PCP and told her. And then she said, well, maybe you can go to a rheumatologist. So then I'm at a rheumatologist. They do the, is it Baton? The Baton the score, they, yeah. They do that. I score however many you can in every category. I got all of them, all the points. And they said, yeah, it makes sense that you have Ehlers-Danlos. We don't, we can't do anything for you here, but we can send a script to U of M. So they sent a script back to U of M and I tried calling them again and it was a a straight no again. And 
it was such a frustrating time because I was trying so hard to get this testing done. And I knew that I had some, I didn't know, I didn't know if I had beds. I had a feeling it was beds, but I knew it was definitely Ehlers-Danlos of some type. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, your body better than anyone. And I was just fighting to get answers and get this testing done. And especially just having a, you know, my first one was a little over a year. So it's like, you're more emotional as a mom. Um, and then I, I was so frustrated. I felt like I couldn't get any answers. And this is very morbid, but I told my husband, I said, if I die, like if I randomly die, like I want you to get genetic testing done because I want, I, I, even though I wouldn't be here, I want to know, like, I want to know I was right, you yeah. know, and for our kids or for, our, you know, we only had one at the time and he was like, okay. And I kind of just let it go for a while because it was so frustrating and it was so stressful and I told myself, like, it's not like cancer where you can go and get chemo and radiation and try to get rid of it. Vascular, Ehlers-Danlos, it's genetic. There's nothing you can do to get rid of it. You're going to have it. So I kind of told him, like, if I do have this, there's nothing I can do to get rid of it. But at least we know that maybe I have this. So we kind of let it go for a little while. Yeah, and, and that, to- like, I want to pause there because, like, that... That whole process is so frustrating that, you know, like you go and you find this information and you feel like you have this condition and you don't know for sure. And you just want somebody to tell you for sure whether or not you have it. You know, a genetic test exists and you just cannot get to it. Right. right? Like nobody. It's like a gate that is closed and you cannot get to it. Right. How did you get through? Like, I, so I, I think what I'm hearing is that you actually like took a step back from that and that's how you got through that period because it was just too much to deal with after I a certain amount of time. A break. I had to take a break because it was, it was stressing me out to the point where I think I, it was making me sick, just mm-hmm. worrying and, and getting the no and then being upset and just feeling like, like nobody's listening to me. And I kind of was just like, We'll just, you know, like I said, if I pass away, I said, get this testing done so we know, at least you will know. And, you know, our, we only had one, our son would know. Yeah. So I kind of let it go. But we, I always told them, like, I think, you know, I know that I have this. So my last baby, or I only have two kids, my second, who's about to be a year tomorrow. Um, I was pregnant with him and it was in my third trimester and I go to an OBGYN that uses the same healthcare system as my primary care. Um, so they're able to look up the records and notes that my doctor has put in there. And my doctor put in like possible Ehlers-Danlos syndrome and my OB came in and she said, do you know what subtype you have? And I told her, I don't know what subtype I have. I wasn't able to get testing done. And she was like, so she's like, you don't know if you have the vascular subtype. And I said, I honestly, I don't know, but I think that's the one I have. And she said, do you go to a cardiologist? And at the time I did see one before when I was having those symptoms of like the dizziness and um, the racing heartbeat and like the orthostatic hypotension would stand up. I like get the flashing lights and I have to hold onto the wall. So I don't like tip over. So I did see him and he cleared me then. Um, he said, everything was fine. Just drink a lot of water and that I do have orthostatic hypotension. So I told her, yes, I've seen someone before. And she said, I want you to go back to him. I want you to get an echo done. I want you to get an EKG and I want to make sure your heart's okay. Um, before you get closer to delivery, labor and delivery, because she didn't want me pushing if my heart had an issue going on. Yeah. So I went back to the same guy that I saw two years previous. And he said, why are you here? And I said, well, my OB wants to make sure my heart looks good before I get closer to delivery. And he's like, why? And I told him, because I think I have you know, Ehlers-Danlos, the vascular subtype. And he was like, oh, you didn't get genetic testing done. And I said, no. And he's like, well, we can do that for you. And I'm like, 
I saw you like two years ago and you did not offer it then, but I was like, yes, I want to get the testing done. So I know, and they outsourced their Amber genetics. So he, he did all of the paperwork and I got that little saliva tube in the mail and I, you know, sent my sample out and then that's, I wasn't hearing anything back for months. This was in May and I had my baby in August. So June, July, August, three months later, I didn't hear anything. And I, like, I wanted to know, but I was so scared at the same time. Like I was nervous to get the answers. I wanted the answers, but I was scared to get the answers. So I ended up having my, my, my second, and it was kind of like a life threatening event. It was, uh, I'm, a stat emergency section and I actually went under anesthesia, which I guess was a good thing in the end because everything that happened when she went to, um, cut me open, my uterus tore all the way over, um, tore through veins. I hemorrhaged over 2000 and she said when she went to sew me up that the sutures just kept ripping through the tissue. So it's like, suturing up jello like they mm. it wouldn't hold the stitches and then every time she moved my uterus it was kind of like it was bleeding through so she would have to hold pressure like the note said 10 to 15 minutes and they would move it and then it'd bleed somewhere else they're cauterizing it and holding pressure and then even in her notes it says like worried or I don't remember if it, said, it didn't say worried but it said like she had a feeling that the stitches might rip through again, like with her moving it and everything. So luckily everything stitched up finally survived it. that I survived it. And I'm here to tell my story about it. And, um, so when that happened, the doctor came out and she told me, I've never had a case like this in my life. I've never experienced anything like this before. And, When she said that, I told my husband, I said, it has to be VEDS because I know um, uterine rupture is one of the things. And even though this was kind of like a mechanic rupture, how it tore when she cut um, with her saying it's not normal. She's never seen this before. And I'm a labor and delivery nurse also. And I've being back in like C-sections, I've never witnessed anything like that happen before. So I know that that's not a normal thing normal situation happen. So I told my husband, I need to know. So after I had my son, I want to say it was maybe a couple weeks after, cause I was still recovering from, you know, the incision and everything. I went up to the, the cardiac doctor's office and I asked her, I said, you know, I got genetic testing done a few months ago and I never heard anything back. Did you guys get results? And she's looking through the computer and everything. She's like, no, we never got results. She said, I'll call you when I figure this out. So then I come home and Ambry never sent the genetic results to my doctors. So they had to call Ambry to get the results. They immediately faxed it over and she called me on the phone and she says, we have your results. And then at that time I said, do I have vascular Ehlers-Danlos? And she said, yes, you have it. So, so this was that like right was- after your son was born, your second yeah. child was born. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. How did that feel for you? It was very emotional. I think just um, the fact that after having a baby, your hormones are already all over the place. And then the fact that I did have a life-threatening event having him, it was kind of like I didn't have time to like work through the emotions of everything. And then finding out I had it. You just read um, some of the stuff online, like I said, where it's like, oh, you're going to die at 46 or this can happen. You can have organ rupture. You can have all of the horrible things that you read about. And I just have this baby and I have my four-year-old, actually, was he three at the time? Three-year-old. He wasn't even four yet. And I'm thinking like, great. Am I even going to be around for them to graduate high school? Your mind goes like all of these places. Um, so it was, it was a lot of 
scariness, I think, when you yeah. first find out. Yeah. Yeah, and there was such a long, like, struggle to get that answer for you. You know, and it seems like, I mean, you just tried and tried and tried. I and did. you finally got the genetic testing, and then they didn't even send the test result to your doctor before you delivered. Right. Like, mm -hmm. that is just mind-boggling truly right and i told my husband and he and he he was mad too because he said you know if, if they known they could have been better prepared when i went back knowing like they would have had blood on standby or maybe someone like a vascular specialist or something in there and yeah um but it all worked out in the end so i try not to you know live on the negatives and you know move past it but yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's hard. I mean, I do think like for that's a field that is constantly kind of growing in knowledge, I think right now, like there's research studies going on for um pregnancy and other like, you know, like not only pregnancy, what am I trying to say? Like menstruation and like all sorts of things that go with the uterus, right? Yeah. And yeah. beds and I think like now they kind of advocate for like an earlier C-section rather than full term because yeah. it doesn't give the uterus enough time to like, it prevents Stretch. it from being completely stretched. Yeah. Right. I remember an interview a couple years ago that I did with Meg Boglin. She described that when she, you know, she found out she had VADS like right as she found out that she was pregnant. And so they, this is like a previous interview. I can put it in the link, like in the description, you know? <laughs> But she was talking about how they, like, the delivery person, like, described that they could see the baby through the uterus. Her wow. tissue was so thin. Wow. And it was, I think it was full term. So it's that's crazy. Did you get your kids tested? I did get them tested. Um, so after I found out I had it, then we... We actually went back to U of M, surprisingly, because of such the, you know, it was such a bad experience. But um, that was one of the only places that we could get the testing done for the boys. And we got them tested and they both were positive or they both have it. Yeah. So the one is a year old at the time of this, pot, that this is airing. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Turns one tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> and then the other one is four. Four, yeah, four. So how do you deal with that as a parent? Um, I think the, the best thing that I can do is just um, making sure I stay on top of their doctor's appointments. And that was another stressful thing. When you first find out about it is trying to figure out who you need to see, what doctors you need on board, like primary prevention, trying to make sure you're staying on top of everything before an event happens. So with the boys, it was like, okay, who are we going to talk to? The genetic counselor was kind of like, you need to see, a, you know, a pediatric cardiologist. So uh, luckily, everything for them is through U of M right now. Um, and they've been great with them. So I can't complain too much with everything now because they are doing a good job with the boys. And at first, it was hard um, when we found out because we found out a couple of days before Christmas. So it's kind of like, you know, supposed to be this joyous moment. It was our first first Christmas and our four year old, his birthday's in November. Um, he's just at that moment where he believes in Santa and everything's magical. And it's like you want that moment to be special. And then you find out and it's it's heartbreaking. And I think at first I had a lot of like guilt, feeling like it was my fault that they had it. And that was hard for me, but, you know, I didn't know I had it. And, and I can't say that I wouldn't have had them knowing that I had it. Um, because when I first found out and me and my husband, we would talk back and forth and say like, Oh, do you, do you think like having kids was the right thing? And we're like, we love our kids. Like we can't imagine them not being here. And then, with me being upset and feeling guilty, I kind of thought back to myself, like, with me, like, if I knew my parents gave it to me, 
what I tell them, like, if my parents had a conversation saying like, oh, well, we shouldn't have kids, then I wouldn't be here, you know? And, yeah. and I, you know, I'm glad I'm here. So that's kind of how I say, like, I know if we didn't have kids, like they wouldn't be here. If they were older, they'd be like, I'm glad I'm here. Like, I'm, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. It's kind of hard to explain. Like, yeah. I wouldn't tell my parents like, oh, I have vets. I wish I was never born. Like, I love everything that I have in in my life, I'm just, I'm blessed with a lot of things and I wouldn't, you know, I don't regret anything now. So I feel better. I think it just takes time. Yeah. It's still up. It's still a roller coaster a lot of the time, but I don't hold that guilt anymore. Good. Which is a big thing for me. I think being able to let that go and kind of look at things differently. Yeah. It's just now I have like, you just worry as a parent for your kids Mm-hmm. Have you had, um, have you gone through like and gotten your scans done now? Yeah. So I go to Cleveland Clinic. I see Dr. Kalahasty there. I go yearly. Um, so every year I get the echo and the EKG. And then every two years is a head to pelvis scan, CT scan. And I've only gone once. And everything was good. They didn't see any like aneurysms or anything like that. So that's good. And then I, I go to U of M <laughs> for <laughs> my, I see a vascular, vascular doctor there. And she did a uh, ultrasound on my extremities and she didn't see any, any issues there. And I see her every three years, but she said, if I need to, if I have any issues or I need to come back sooner, just to let her know and I could get in with her. And then I've been having some lung issues recently. And I told my husband, it's crazy because I feel like the older I'm getting, the more symptoms of VEDS I'm getting. Whereas before I kind of just had like the hypermobility, the skin scarring um, now, and then like the heart issues and stuff. Now I'm, I'm like having issues where I'm coughing up blood. Mm. Um, and only, and it's weird. Cause it's only when I wake up in the morning, like I'll take a deep breath and I, Next thing you know, I'm coughing, I'm coughing up. They look like clots. It's not like yeah. it's mixed in. And I just recently seen a lung lung nodule doctor at Beaumont. Um, because when I went to Cleveland Clinic last year, they did see what they thought were nodules. Mm-hmm. Um, I had the repeat scan six months later and the original ones were gone. And then they showed different ones, like new ones in different spots. So when I went to see the lung nodule doctor actually last week, he said he thinks it might, it's most likely due to vets that it might be some kind of bleed that kind of like closes up, like almost like a clot, like it's healing. And then I'm probably coughing it up because he says like our bodies just absorb whatever is in there. And he said um, with them moving like that, it's not like, like it's not cancerous or anything like that. Thank goodness. So, um, but before I never had issues with like that and, um, just the older I'm getting, I'm starting to get these more symptoms and I feel like I'm bruising easier and, Mm -hmm. but I'm glad I finally have answers because if I didn't have answers for all this, I would probably be even more of a mess now than I was then. And I think, and I tell my husband, Like I call my, my baby, like our little, like miracle one, because if it wasn't for him, we wouldn't know in that OB doctor, she's the one that fought for me who said, you need to go and get the testing done because I feel like everyone else wasn't taking it seriously. And like, I'm thankful that I went, I'm thankful the second time the cardiologist decided to run the test. But overall, if I was never pregnant with the last one, I still wouldn't know. Right. Yeah. You kind of be in that queue of like trying to get testing and I wasn't able to get it and I will never know. Kind of. Right. Thing. Right. Such a frustrating space to be in. Mm-hmm. Do you have a family history of events? Like has any, do they think either of your parents had it? So well, my dad got tested and he was negative. My older brother was tested and he was negative. My younger sister was tested and she's negative. Um, my mom was remarried and had my two younger siblings. So I'm not sure if it came from my mom, 
or find the de novo mutation. My mom didn't get the testing done, but my two siblings, my younger one, he didn't get tested, but everyone else, they're negative. And nobody has the hypermobility like I do with mm-hmm. like my knees and my fingers and the easy bruising. So I, I'm not sure if it's yeah. de novo. I think it's de novo. That's what my husband was saying too. He's like, I think you have the de novo mutation. So, <laughs> but um, everyone that was tested was negative. Yeah. Well, that's, I mean, that's like a good thing. And it's also a, a strange place to be in. Like as somebody who has a de novo mutation myself, it's yeah. like, I am you know, glad that none of my family members have to deal with this. I right. wouldn't wish it on anybody. Yeah. But on this, on the other hand, it there's sometimes I feel like, gosh, if I knew that one of my parents who is, you know, older than that median life, like survival yeah. rate or whatever uh-huh. had this, mm-hmm. like that might make me feel a whole lot better. Right. You know, like I could see them and how far like what they've been through in their life and have a better idea of how I'm going to fare. Right. But then maybe that's a bad thing. Like maybe they wouldn't be doing well. And then I would just be like, Oh, that's my life. Yeah. Right. Like, I don't think there's a good, I don't think there's a good option truly. Right. Yeah. I don't, I don't know if my mom has it or not. Yeah. Well, so going through that, you know, usually I ask people, you know, what they would recommend to somebody who is newly diagnosed or what kind of advice they would give. But I really like to focus this question for people who are listening, who think that they have VEDS and haven't been able to get that genetic testing or are thinking about going through that process. Do you have any advice you would give somebody who's kind of in that same um, struggle that you were stuck in? Um, my advice would just be to keep fighting because nobody knows your body better than you do. If you know something's wrong, and and I can say this as a nurse too, like nobody's going to fight for you. You have to fight for yourself. I've been in situations where me as a patient, you know, I knew something was, was going on and it's like, you're telling a doctor and they're kind of like, okay, well, just like the first one, put lotion on your skin. Like that's not an, it's not an answer. If you get some kind of outlandish crazy answer like that and you know it's not right you go find a different doctor go find somebody else that's gonna fight for you fight with you because you're the only person that's gonna get the answers to your health is yourself you have Mm -hmm. to really fight for yourself and it's sad that it is that way but it's really the only way that you're gonna be able to get answers yeah that's really great advice that's something that got me through Similar advice got me through the period where I was trying to get tested and just kept hitting roadblock after roadblock. And I had like this pain in my neck. I thought it was something serious and it turned out to be a dissection that was diagnosed like months later, you know. But there was a moment where I felt like I was going crazy and that I I must be crazy, you know, because everybody was treating me like I was. And my mom said, you know, don't don't give up if you feel like something's wrong. Right. You know, keep pursuing it. And that advice that you just gave people, I think it's so important. Yeah. You do know your oh, body best. Well, thank- thankfully, what happened to you wasn't anything anything worse. Right. Oh, my goodness. Like, that you were able to say months later that you found out you had it and, you know, that yeah. you're still here and everything. Oh. Yeah, I don't want anybody to go through that. So I love that advice that you gave. Like it is, it's hard sometimes. It really is hard to keep going, and if you need to take a break from it and then come back to it, like that's okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And but I don't think give that's up a, completely. That's a good thing too, because sometimes it can get stressful and overwhelming. And if you do, like you said, need to take a break, don't give up altogether, though. Or just like I said, like how I knew I had it, and I just told my husband, like. I know this is what it is Mm -hmm. to make sure somehow that it comes back up in another talk with a different doctor. I might have Ehlers-Danlos and there might be that one doctor that's like, huh, let's get testing done. I love that. What would you want medical professionals to know about VEDS? Oof, everything. I feel like nobody knows about it. Even 
even the lung doctor that I just saw, he, he told me he hasn't dealt with this since he was in medical school. And he was an older guy. He said, now I have, I have studying to do. He's like, you gave me some studying to do. And it's like, no matter what field, I feel like it's just, it's not known. People don't know about it. So any, anybody that wants information about it, that knows about it and learns about it, if they can just keep spreading the information, I think that's the best way. Any, any doctor that wants to give information or spread information. And I feel like it's mainly us that has to do that footwork Mm -hmm. of spreading the information around. Yeah, that's great. I mean, just the general awareness is so important and it is, it truly like it, it stinks sometimes that it's on us to do it Mm -hmm. and to spread it. But I think, you know, like more and more people are getting diagnosed and the more that we continue to share our stories with our doctors and our friends and our family and people that we don't know, like the, and especially as more of us are getting diagnosed, I mean, that is going to multiply and multiply into more and more knowledge. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story. I really appreciate it so much. And I really hope that it helps somebody who's dealing with some of the similar things that you've dealt with. Yeah, I hope so. Thank you for having me on here. I know I'm only a year out, but it's, it's, it's good to talk to another person that has beds. You don't feel so alone out there. Yeah. And community, I think is so important too. like connecting with other people in the community in general is incredibly important. So I'll connect with you afterwards and make sure that you're connected with people. But thank you so much, Samantha. Yeah. Thank you. Samantha wanted to leave you with this final thought. She said, I am glad I fought for my health, so now my children don't have to fight for their answers. Thank you everyone for listening in today, and thank you, Samantha, for sharing your story with us and raising awareness of vets. In the episode, I mentioned the previous interview with Meg Boglin, and I've linked that in the episode show notes so you can find it easily. On the next episode, on November 12th, we'll talk to Tyler Farley, who was diagnosed with FADS when he was 17 years old after a bowel perforation. Don't forget to subscribe to staying connected on your podcast player so you don't miss any future episodes. And if you like this show, I hope you will consider sharing it with your friends on social media to help us raise awareness of VETS together. You can also support the production of this podcast by joining my Patreon at patreon.com translucentone. Thank you so much, and I will see you soon.